Hello and welcome to SPSS Introduction. My name is Nairi Mason and I am a trainer with the Digital Literacy Team at the Australian National University. I am an applied statistician, psychometrician and research consultant and have been using SPSS for 27 years. If you ever need help with SPSS after this session, please feel free to email myself or the Digital Literacy Team with your questions. If you haven't already received the SPSS exercise file I will be working with today, you can download it from this website. Just select the SPSS tab, click on employee underscore data dot sab and save it to your computer. When it has finished downloading, just double click on the file and it will open in SPSS automatically. The PDF handout for this course can also be found at the web link below. SPSS stands for the Statistical Package for the Social Sciences. It was made specifically for social scientists who need to use statistics for their research but aren't actually statisticians. So it's very user friendly for people who aren't very familiar with stats, but powerful enough for applied statisticians to use as well. This session will cover how to import Excel files, how to set up a data file and create variables in the variable view of SPSS, how to enter data in data view, how to create and edit graphs in the output viewer, running descriptive statistics in the output viewer, how to use the syntax editor, how to export output to Word, PDF, etc., how to compute and recode data, and how to select subsets of data and split files into groups. If you have already entered your data into an Excel file, it's quite simple to import this data into SPSS. As long as you reserve the first row of your Excel spreadsheet for your headers, your data is all that is included in the spreadsheet. There are no annotations anywhere around, such as here, because it will confuse SPSS if there are words mixed in with numbers in particular. So I will delete this annotation and save the data file and open it up in SPSS. Here I have a blank SPSS data file. To open up the Excel file, I just need to go into the file menu at the top, open and select data. By default, it's only going to look for SPSS data files, so we need to change the file type to search for, and that is going to be Excel. It is in my data folder, and it is the Excel import.xlsx file. Then I will click open. You have to choose the spreadsheet that you want to import because you can only import one spreadsheet at a time if you have multiple. By default, read variable names from first row of data will be ticked, which is why it's important to leave your headers in the first row. If you do have hidden rows and columns and you do not want to ignore them, just untick this box. Here is a preview of what your data file will look like in SPSS. And when you're happy, all you have to do is click OK. And there is your data. Now I will open up the employee data file that we will be working with today. So we'll go into the file menu and then open and select data. Then select employee underscore data dot sav and click open. So here is the employee.data.sav file. This contains the employee records of a medium-sized company. In the first column, they have recorded the person's ID number. It's always good practice when dealing with data to include an ID column so that you can keep track of who's who in your data set because the ID number is not always going to align with the row number if you sort your data in any particular way. 
The next column is where they've taken into account the person's gender and they've coded it as little m for male and little f for female. Ideally with SPSS, if you have a binary data like this, um, or data that only has two possible outcomes, and yes, I know this is an old data set, we have more possible gender um, values here these days, but here they only have two potential um, outcomes, male or female. SPSS would prefer it if you coded this as a dummy variable or an indicator variable, which means that it would be coded in terms of zeros and ones instead of letters, or even instead of one and two. And the reason for that is a zero one variable can be used in a greater number of statistical analyses. If this was coded as zero for male and one for female, then I could put this directly into a regression equation, for example. The next column is where they've taken into account the person's birth date. The next column, their education level, which is measured in years. The next one is their job category. There are three job categories and they have used numerical coding for these three categories, which is good. Um, we'll have a look at what they stand for a little bit later on. The beginning salary is in this column, oh, beginning salary in this column, the current salary in the column before it. Job time is how long they've been in this company in terms of months. Previous experience is how much experience they had in months before joining the company. And minority is whether or not they are in a minority classification. Now this has been coded correctly. The responses are either yes or no. So they've coded them as zero and one. The convention is zero stands for absence or no. One stands for presence or yes in these particular types of variables. So zero is no and one is yes. Now this is where you can view your data and enter your data, but SVSS is different to most spreadsheet type applications because it has some safeguards to make sure that you don't make statistical errors. And that's why we have something called the variable view. If you look at the bottom left hand corner, at the moment we are looking at the data view, but if you click on the variable view tab, this is where SVSS wants to know more information about your variables so it can guide you to making good statistical decisions. The first column is where you tell SVSS what you want to label your variables in the data view. You are restricted in what you can call your variables. You cannot start with numbers, you cannot have spaces or special characters, and you are restricted to a limit of around 64 characters. If you do want to have spaces in your variable name, you can use underscores. The type column is where you tell SBSS what type of data you will be entering. When I click on the cell for type, and the ID variable, you'll notice that we get a blue box with three dots. If you click on the blue box, a flyout menu appears. This is where you select the type of data you have. Essentially, you will either have numeric or string. All of these other options relate to numeric data as well. If you're only going to be entering numbers, it's probably easiest to pick numeric. But if you want to see in the data view, a comma delimiting thousands, millions, etc., you can choose comma. The dot option is the same as comma, only it uses a dot to delimit thousands and millions, and a comma for the decimal place. This is how many European countries denote decimal places. Scientific notation is an option for when you are dealing with very, very large or very, very small numbers. So that the numbers actually fit in the columns in the data view, it will apply a scientific notation of an E and a power of 10 exponent together with your number. If the 10 exponent 
is negative, it's a very small number, and if it's positive, it's a very, very large number. The date option is where you decide what format you are going to be entering dates or the format you are going to be entering times. By picking one of these formats, it allows you to use SPSS's date and time calculations in the compute menu. The dollar option is also just for numeric data, but it sticks a dollar sign in the front. So if you want a dollar sign as well as comma delimiters, you can choose one of the options further down the menu. Custom currency is also for currency, obviously. You have five options, which you can change in the edit and then options menu. You can choose a different prefix. Here I've just left it as a dollar sign for this example. And you can also add a suffix. So I've put in EU here for European dollars. The string option is for everything other than numeric data. So if you're typing in words, you need to tell SPSS it is a string variable, otherwise you will not be allowed to type in letters or words or special characters at all. If you do have imported data and it is decided that your variable is string rather than numeric, please be careful changing a variable from string to numeric data because if you did have any words or anything that was very important that was non-numeric, if you change it to a numeric variable type, it will delete all of that information. So to be on the safe side, you could just duplicate your variable, leave one as string and change the other one to numeric. I'll now click on continue and we'll have a look at the next column. The next column is called width. And that is where you tell SBSS how many characters to allow when entering data. So here for the ID variable, the width is set to two. So you can only enter up to two digit numbers. If you tried to enter a third, it would not let you. Generally, when you're dealing with data, I recommend that you have the width much larger than you actually need because sometimes when we're doing data entry, we accidentally hit more than one key at once. So in this example, if I accidentally hit a second key um, when I was putting in a two digit number, it should show me that there were three digits that I entered because that was my error. But because the width is set to two, I'm not going to see that data entry because it did not allow that third digit. So when you're entering data, make sure that the width is larger than you need so that you can pick up on data entry errors. Please also be careful when changing the width um, retrospectively. If you had four digit numbers and you change the width to two, it would chop off the last two digits. And if you hit the save button, then you would lose those two digits permanently. So set the width for larger than you need and leave it alone. The next column is um, called decimals and that is where you tell SBSS how many decimal places you want displayed. So if you want to see two decimal places in the data view then you just set the decimals to two. You can toggle this on and off um, anytime you want, it does not affect the data. This is just a formatting column. The next column is where you can give your variable a more descriptive label. So here in the name column, you are restricted, whereas in the label column, you are not. You do not have to give your variable a label. Um, if, for example, this variable gender, we did not give it a label gender, it would still say gender in the output because that is the name of our variable in the data set. But here for birth date, it has a non-descriptive name, so they had to give it a label date of birth so you could understand the data better in the output. You are not restricted in any way, shape or form as to what you can label your variable. You can start with numbers, you can start with an at symbol, you can start with an asterisk, it really doesn't matter. 
The values column is where you tell SBSS about your coding scheme. So if we have a look at the values cell for job category, and I click on the blue box with the three dots, you can see that one stands for clerical, two for custodial, and three for manager. It's quite easy to label your coding scheme. So let's just say we had a fourth category, which was coded as four. So I put four in the value box, and I will label that CEO. And then click add, and that's in the box. You don't have to label your coding scheme, but it's a very good practice because if you don't give these numbers a label, you'll just see one, two, three, and four in the output and not know what categories they stand for. By giving them a label, you will only see clerical, custodial, manager, and CEO, and not the numbers associated with them. And as mentioned before, SBSS prefers it if you use a numeric coding scheme. So it's a good idea to do this. If you want to change any of these labels or the values that are associated with the labels, you just have to click on the one you want to change. So for example, CEO, and then I can change the label to Big Boss. I can even change the value to six if I want to. Then we get a change button. When I click that, it changes it. If you want to remove one of these categories because you made a mistake, you just have to select the one that you want to remove and then click the remove button. There is also a handy spell checking feature. So if you're really, really bad at spelling, you can hit this spelling button in the top right hand corner. And luckily no spelling errors were found. Okay, I'll just click OK and go to the next one. The missing column is also about coding schemes. This is where you tell SVSS about any codes that you have used in a scale in particular that should not be used in calculations. So for example, if we had a Likert scale where one stood for strongly disagree and five for strongly agree, you want the numbers one to five used in calculations. But if you had another type of code for not applicable options, you would generally code that as 99, as we tend to do in the social sciences. Um, you pick a number for the not applicable option, but you don't want SPSS to use that number as part of your regular scale. So you don't want it used in any calculations. And that's what the missing column is for. So if I click on the blue box with the three dots for this cell, you'll notice that it already has a zero included here. Now the reason for that is that sometimes you get data from um, SurveyMonkey, for example, and missing cells are filled in with a zero rather than just left blank. Now zero is a number, but it's a number you do not want used in scales, right, in any calculations. So you have to tell SBSS that zero actually denotes a missing cell and not a real number. Now here, if I had another option that was 99 not applicable, I could type in 99 into this second box and it can have up to three discrete missing values. If you have more than three, you can choose this range plus one optional discrete missing value option. And you could do everything from a value of six to 100 if you wanted to, then everything that SBSS saw that was between six and 100 would not be included in calculations. You can also add a discrete value that is outside that range, say zero, for example, and it would include that as well. But in this case, we just have one discrete missing value. I can leave 99 in there, it doesn't really matter. Then click OK, and we'll go on to the next one. The columns column is uh, where you tell SBSS how wide you want the columns to be displayed in the data view itself. So as you've seen, I can just click and drag columns wider and narrower, and that does the same thing. But if you want everything to be uniform, uniformly eight characters wide, you can specify that here in the columns column. 
It doesn't change the data, so it's not going to do anything bad to the data like the width column would. So you can change the columns anytime you want. The align column is where you tell SPSS which variables you want right aligned, left aligned and centre aligned. It's purely a formatting thing, so if it's really important to you, you can change that here as well. The measurement column is extremely important. So here, if I click on the cell for the ID variable, you'll see that we have three options, scale, ordinal and nominal. For the ordinal variable here, uh, sorry, the string variable here, for gender, we only have ordinal and nominal. And that's because string variables can only be nominal or ordinal levels of measurement. Because most people that come to this SVSS class do not have a, a very strong stats background, I will explain the difference between these levels of measurement now. In statistics, there are four levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval and ratio. These levels of measurement determine what kind of descriptive statistics you can use, what kind of graphical representations of data you can use, and what kind of significance tests you can use appropriately in statistics. The first one I'll go through is nominal. Nominal refers to data which are essentially names, labels, categories or classifications. So here's an example of running shoes. If people are wearing Nike, I give them a one, Brooks, I code it as two, Adidas, I code it as three, and ASICS, I code as four. These numbers are not actual numbers that you want to add up in calculations. They just represent categories of running shoes. So I can't add up a Nike and a Brooks and get an Adidas because it makes no sense whatsoever. The only descriptive statistics I can use with this type of data are frequencies and percentages. And I can also do something called non-parametric statistics. So things like chi-square, which you might be familiar with. The next type of data is ordinal. It's pretty much the same as nominal, only the names, labels and categories have a specified order to them. So if I have a look at the grades for a particular university course, and I code the people who failed a zero, pass, one, credit, two, distinction, three, and high distinction as four, these are still not numbers that you can add up in the same way as real numbers but they do have a particular order to them. And the order that I have used is reflected in the numbers as well. So we can't add up a fail and a pass and be guaranteed of a distinction because that doesn't make sense. You're passing a credit and get a distinction. You still can use frequencies and percentages, but with ordinal levels of measurement, you can also calculate measures of central tendency. So medians and modes, and we can also calculate measures of variability called quartiles. You can perform non-parametric and some parametric statistics with ordinal levels of measurement. So things like Mann-Whitney U, correlation and regression. The third type of measurement is interval. Interval level of measurement represents numbers that you can add, subtract, etc. The only thing is that zero has no meaning. Zero does not mean an absence of something. So an example of this type of measurement is degrees Celsius. You can have minus 10 degrees, zero degrees, and 10 degrees, but zero degrees does not mean an absence of temperature. With this type of data, you can also not perform ratios. So 10 degrees Celsius is not half of 20 degrees Celsius. It just doesn't make sense. So yes, you can add numbers together. You can use descriptive statistics like means, medians, and modes. And you can use standard deviations as a measure of variability. You can perform non-parametric and parametric tests, just like you can with the next level of measurement. 
which is ratio. These are also real numbers, but zero does mean zero. So for example, the number of people in a classroom, I can add up however many people there are and say get four people. Um, if the number is zero, that means there are no people in that room. You can perform ratios, which is why it's called a ratio level of measurement. 10 is half of 20 people. You can perform exactly the same statistics as you could for the interval level of measurement. There is no difference whatsoever, which is why in SPSS, they do not ask for the difference between interval and ratio levels of measurement when you're choosing your level of measurement. Both of these are grouped as scale, okay, because the same statistics are legitimate for both. Now I'll go back to the SPSS file. So now back in this SPSS file, they have selected the level of measurement for all of these variables, but unfortunately they have made a few mistakes. So for the ID variable, they selected the measurement as scale. And yes, they did use numbers for their IDs, but these ID numbers are not real numbers in the real world. They represent people. And these people aren't necessarily put in by order, so the numbers do not reflect order either. So this should be a nominal level of measurement. Gender is correct. That is a nominal level of measurement. Birth date is correct. It is a scale level of measurement because we are dealing with time, even though we haven't actually got the person's age here. So globally, we are dealing with a scale level of measurement. Educational, and level, educational level in years is set at ordinal which is incorrect because we're also dealing with time again, which is a scale measurement. Job category has been set to ordinal. Now, this would be correct if they had used the appropriate numbers. So if I click on the blue box with the three dots for values, you'll notice that they have used the wrong numerical order for these particular classifications. Custodial Job categories get paid a lot less than clerical, but manager is in the right position. So in order for this to be classified as an ordinal level of measurement, we would have to recode this variable so that one was custodial and two was clerical. That is possible in SPSS and I'll show you how to do that later. But at the moment, we can't treat this variable as ordinal we can only treat it as a nominal level of measurement. The next few variables are correct. Current salary and beginning salary, we're dealing with numbers and currency, so that is correct, it's scale. Months since hire, again, we're dealing with time. Previous experience in months, we're dealing with time, so that's also scale. And minority classification, unfortunately, they got incorrect as well. We have a yes, no variable, and there is no order to that. So it is a nominal level of measurement. The role column doesn't have a lot of functionality in SPSS, but if it helps you to determine which variables you're going to use for what later on, you can label your independent variables as input, your response or dependent variables as target, in a lot of cases, your variables are going to act as both an input and a target variable, so you can choose both. If, for example, like with ID, you're not going to use it for analysis at all, you can label it as none. You can also label your variables as something you want to partition the data by or to split the data by, but like I said, it's up to you. You don't have to use it at all. Now I'll show you how to create a new variable. All I have to do is click on the cell for name in row 11, and I'm going to create a new variable for job satisfaction. So I am restricted in what I can name the variable in the data view, so I can't have any spaces. I'm just going to call it job sat. Then enter, 
and you'll see that SPSS pre-populates the rest of this row for me. Now, job satisfaction is going to be measured on a five-point scale. Strongly disagree to strongly agree. So I will be entering numbers and numbers only. The width only needs to be one, but like I said before, you want the width to be much wider than you need so you can pick up on data entry errors. In the decimals column, I don't actually need any decimals. So I don't need 16. I'm gonna change this to zero. Wow, that's weird. Zero. And it's doing it again. Okay. The number of zeros in the decimals doesn't have to be two, so I can change that to zero. I am going to give this a more descriptive label because job set just doesn't describe it. So I'm going to type in job satisfaction. Then in the values column, I have to tell SPSS what labels I want to apply to my coding scheme. So I'll click on the blue box with the three dots. The value one is going to represent strongly disagree. Then I'll click add. Two will be agree. Three will be neutral. Four will be agree. And five will be strongly agree. I will also have a not applicable option for people who've only just started in the job and they don't know if they like it or not yet. So I'm going to label that um, a 99 and label that not applicable. And then add. Then I'll click OK and move on to the missing column. Now I have got a code that I do not want included in calculations. So I'll click on the blue box with three dots, on the radio button for discrete missing values, and type 99 into the first box. Then OK. Columns I don't really care about, alignment I don't really care about, but the level of measurement I do. Now, here's where it gets a little controversial. In the social sciences, they tend to use Likert scale data like this as a scale level of measurement. Statistically speaking, it is strictly an ordinal level of measurement. So it depends on the discipline that you're studying or researching in as to which of these you will pick. But a well-constructed scale can be argued under some circumstances to fit a scale level of measurement classification. Okay, so if we click on the data view tab in the bottom left hand corner now, you'll see that I have a new column called JobSat and I have lots of little dots representing missing data. Remember, do not fill in zeros for missing data. Because I have labels for my um, my coding scheme. I could just type in the numbers, but I might forget what numbers refer to which label. So there's a handy feature in SBSS where if you click on the view menu at the top of the screen and then tick the box called value labels, you'll notice that all the numbers for the codes we had before have been replaced by their actual labels. And there's also a drop down menu where you can select the label instead of having to pick the number that it represents. So for job satisfaction, I also get drop down menus and I can choose from there. For example, you can also copy and paste to multiple cells if there are a lot of agrees and you know that it's just going to be tedious typing them all in. You can just right click on the cell and copy it. Select all the cells that you want to paste to. Right click and paste. The same thing uh, applies to the variable view. If you have a lot of questions 
on your survey and they have the exact same coding scheme, so strongly disagree to strongly agree, you can copy the values cell and paste it to multiple variables as well to save a lot of time. Okay, so I'll move back to the data view again. And the next thing I will show you is how to create descriptive statistics. The first step in data analysis is to have a look at a graphical representation of your data. The first graphical representation we'll look at is a frequency histogram. These are used for scale levels of measurement to look at the distribution of values. To do that, we go into the graphs menu. You'll notice that there are several different ways you can create a graph in SPSS. Um, I like to show people how to use the legacy dialogues because you have more control over the output. So if you go to legacy dialogues and histogram, which is right down the bottom, we'll have a look at the frequency distribution of a person's current salary. So I'll click on current salary and then on the arrow to move it into the variable box. I will also tick the box to display the normal curve because one of the main reasons for looking at a frequency histogram is to see if it follows a normal distribution. I'm also going to panel the histogram by gender. Now what this will do is give us different histograms, one for females and one for males. If I panel by rows, then we will get two histograms, one on top of each other. This is useful for when you're comparing two groups based on the x-axis of your data. If you panel by columns, you'll be comparing them on the y-axis and you will have the two histograms side by side. I'm going to be comparing genders based on the x-axis, which will be current salary. So I'll put gender into the rows box. Now I'll click OK. And here is the output. The histogram opens up in what's called an output viewer, and this is a separate window within SPSS, as you can see here. It's completely independent of your data. So if you're familiar with Excel, where if you change your data, the graph automatically updates, that does not happen in SPSS. If you change your data, you have to rerun any analysis that you have performed. The output viewer consists of two windows. There's a navigation pane on the left hand side and then there's the main window where you see your output. In the output window, at the beginning of every analysis that you run, you will see the syntax that was used to create that analysis. This is useful as a record of exactly what you have done and how you have done it. Um, if you do want to use syntax at a later point, that text has to be in something called a syntax editor, which I will go through a little bit later on. If you want to change the title of any graphs in the output viewer, it's quite simple. Um, when you ever hover over an object in the output viewer, it says double click to activate. And it means just that you have to double click and then you can activate it and change the text. So I can change this to histogram of salary by gender. You also have a formatting toolbar at the top, so you can change the text color, um, the text font, anything you like. When you're happy with your changes, all you have to do is click somewhere in blank space outside that dotted line. There you go. The output viewer also includes some extra syntax underneath the title. This tells you which data set was used to create this output because it is possible to have multiple spreadsheets open at once. It's a good idea to keep track of which spreadsheet you actually performed the analysis on. You can delete anything from the output viewer if you don't want it. I'll just simply click on the data set text and hit the delete button and it goes away. If you ever want to create annotations for your output, it's quite easy. You just have to click on the output where you want the annotation to go under. So this is now selected. Then you go to the insert menu, new text, 
and you get a new text box where you can type in annotations. So I'll type in Instagram for males is positively skewed. Now we'll get on to the graph itself. So you can see here we have two histograms, one for female salaries and one for male salaries. The normal curve has been superimposed on top of these histograms. This is what a normal distribution would look like given the mean and the standard deviation for each one of these distributions. The distribution for females follows a roughly normal curve, whereas the distribution for males does not. This is called a positive skew because the tail of the distribution is towards the high end of the graph. If you want to change anything about a chart in SPSS, it's quite simple. You just have to double click to activate and it opens up a chart editor. The chart editor also comes with a properties window. If you did not get the properties window, the easiest way to get it back is to just double click on the chart in the chart editor. The properties window will give you options that are relevant to whatever you click in the chart in the chart editor. So if you want to change the colour of the bars in the chart, just click on the bars so they get that yellow halo around them. Then in the properties window, you get a fill and border tab. This allows you to change the colour. You can also apply a pattern if you wish. So I'll change this to purple click apply and my bars have changed. You can also change the binning of your bars. Generally the automatic option is fine in SPSS but if you have a reason why you want your bars to represent a certain interval width you can change that in custom. So if I want my interval width to be 1000 I'll click apply. You can see that it changes the graph quite considerably. If I want to change that to 10,000, click apply, it changes it even more. The bin width for all histograms will drastically change the look of your distribution. It's best not to change the bin width unless you have a very good reason for doing so because we don't want to lie with statistics. If you want to change the values of the y-axis, all you have to do is click on one of the values of the y-axis and then in the properties window you have a scale tab. So here I could change the increments for example from 50 to 20 and apply and I have more increments. I can change the scale so that it goes beyond 150, say 160, and then apply, and it changes it accordingly. You can also do the same thing with the um, x-axis. So if I click on one of the values of the x-axis, the scale tab will give me all the details that are relevant to that part of the chart. When you're happy with your chart, all you have to do is close the chart editor and the properties window will close with it. So you don't need to close the properties window separately, just close the chart editor. The next type of graph I will show you is a scatter plot. Scatter plots are used to look at the relationship between two scale levels of measurement or two ordinal levels of measurement. So to do this, we'll go into the Graphs menu, Legacy Dialogues, and choose Scatter Dot. We'll just do a simple scatter plot, two variables at a time. Click Define. And I'm going to have a look at the relationship between a person's salary and their education level. So I'll click Current Salary, and I'll put it onto the Y axis. And there is a convention in statistics that if you have a clear dependent variable, it will always go on the y-axis. So naturally, we would expect education level and years to influence a person's salary. 
So therefore salary is our dependent variable and education level is our independent variable. So the independent variable goes on the x-axis. I'm also going to label the cases by a person's employee ID code. This will allow me to identify individual points on the scatter plot and it will tell me what their ID code is. If I don't label the cases by employee code, then it will just tell me the row number in our data set. And this can change if you ever resort your data in any way. So I'm going to label cases by employee code and click OK. And here is our frequency histogram. What we like to see with a frequency histogram is a definite correlation, so a definite relationship between the two variables. Ideally, this would be a straight line relationship, but if you kind of squint at this graph, you'll notice that it probably isn't a straight line. It's a little bit more of a curvilinear relationship. To assess the strength and direction of the relationship as well as the shape of it, we normally want to apply the linear regression line or the line of best fit. To do this, we will double click on the chart to open up the chart editor, then go into the elements menu and choose fit line at total. And here we have our linear regression line and it has also superimposed the linear regression equation that was used to create this line. If you don't want the linear regression equation on your graph, and it is quite difficult to move it around, then you might want to untick this box in the fit line tab on the properties window, untick attach label to line, and click apply. But you do want to take note of what that regression equation was. Looking at this relationship, you can see that the data doesn't quite fit the straight line relationship. You can play around with what line best fits your data in the fit line box as well. So here it looks like a quadratic equation might fit it. Now the straight line equation gives you an R squared linear value of 0.436. This tells you how well it fits your data. So this value is saying that 43.6% of the variation in a person's current salary can be explained by their education level, which is a moderate amount. If I change that to a quadratic line and click apply, the R squared quadratic line explains 58.9% of the variation in current salary. So it is a much better fit to the data. If you're looking for outliers and you want to identify what their ID number is, all you have to do is click on this target icon underneath the file menu. When I hover over it, it says data label mode. It changes your cursor into a target and then you click on the dot of interest. And this is saying that that particular point is ID number 29 in the data set. If you don't want to see that number anymore, you just have to click on the point again. But I do want to identify it. To get your cursor back, you click on the icon that looks like a target a second time, and you get your mouse back. Now we'll close this and go on to the next graph, which is going to be a bar chart. Bar charts are used to look at frequencies and percentages for nominal and ordinal levels of measurement. So we're going to have a look at a clustered bar chart, which means that we'll have different coloured bars for different groups, and we'll be looking at employment category. So if you click on the graphs menu, legacy dialogues, and then bar, we'll choose clustered, and then define. So with employment category, that's going to be our category axis. So I'll click on employment category and move that into the category axis box. We're going to define the clusters by two different groups, and that's going to be minority cl classification. So we'll move that into define clusters by. 
You'll notice that you can also panel these bar charts by rows and columns too, but I'm just going to keep this simple. So what this is going to do is it will group our bars by employment category and we will have different colours according to whether or not the person is in a minority classification. You can change what the bars represent. It's usually going to be number of cases or percentage of cases. So I'm going to have a look at the percentage of cases and then click OK. And here's our bar chart. By clicking percentage of cases, I get the percentage within minority classification. So over 80% in clerical positions are in a minority classification. Much less than 20% are in custodial positions and a very small amount are in management positions. This particular variable is an ordinal level of measurement, however, it was not coded properly. So I would like to change the order of these bars without having to recode my variable. And that's quite simple to do. When we double click to open the chart editor, if you click on one of the labels for the employment categories, the properties window will give you a categories tab. In this category tab, you're able to exclude variables and also reorder variables. So I want to reorder these. I'll click on clerical and then the down arrow to move it down in order and then apply. So now they're in their appropriate order. If you wanted to see this chart without management cases, I could click on manager and then the red cross to exclude it and apply as well. So you can manipulate these charts without actually having to change the variable in any way. But I want manager back, so I'll click on manager and then the green up arrow to move it back into the box and then apply. When you're happy, just close the chart editor. Now we'll move on to descriptive statistics. The first type of analysis we'll do is actually called a descriptives analysis, and this will give us the means and standard deviations for all of the scale levels of measurement in our data set. So if I click on the Analyze menu, then go to Descriptive Statistics. As I said, the first one we look at is called Descriptives. You can put as many variables as you want to in this box, so it's worthwhile putting all our scale levels of measurement in, in one go. I'll just hold down the Shift key and then click on the last scale level of measurement, so I highlight all of them in one go and then move that into the box. All you have to do now is click on OK and there is our output. It's a descriptive summary table. The first column tells you how many cases were used to calculate the statistic. This particular data set has absolutely no missing values, so it's always going to be 474. It also gives you the minimum value for each variable, the maximum, the mean, and the standard deviation. If you want to change anything about tables in SPSS, that's also possible, but you'll be changing the text, so it's as simple as double clicking and changing the text. So if you think that your audience doesn't know what a mean is, but does know what an average is, you can change the label for this column to average by double clicking on mean and just overwriting and typing average. You can also highlight selected numbers if you wish to, because we get a formatting toolbar as well. So if you want to make particular mention of this particular value and this particular value, you can make them bold. You can also change the text color. You can do anything you like. Yes, you can also change the values in the table, but that's what we call unethical behavior. And we don't mess 
with the numbers in the table. When you're happy with your changes, you just click somewhere outside of that dotted line in blank space and it closes off the text editing. The next type of analysis we'll have a look at is a frequencies analysis. This is what you would use for nominal and ordinal levels of measurement to look at frequencies and percentages in the groups you are comparing. So to do that, we go into the analyze menu, descriptive stats, and frequencies is the first option. So we can put our nominal and ordinal levels of measurement into the variable box. That will be gender, employment category, and minority classification. The good thing about the frequencies analysis is that you can also automatically produce charts for all the variables that are in this box. So before we had to do everything one by one, but if you click on the charts button on the right hand side, you can choose to have bar charts or histograms or pie charts for all of the variables that you choose. So I'm going to ask for bar charts and percentages. If you have a scale level of measurement, so education level and current salary, and you put that into the box, you can ask for histograms as well. You can also, if I click continue, if you put scale levels into this box, you can ask for extra statistics. So you'll get a summary much like descriptive statistics, but you can get some extra statistics as well. So if I click on statistics, you'll see that for ordinal levels of measurement, you can ask for the quartiles as a measure of variability, um, percentiles, mean, median, and mode, and lots of other statistics as well. So that's another way to get descriptive statistics as well as charts. I'll just cancel here. If you do put a scale level of measurement into this box, then the frequency tables are going to be very, very large. So I would recommend if you do that, only put scale levels of measurement into the box. Don't mix them up with your ordinal and nominal and untick display frequency tables because they will be unreasonably large. But I've just got nominal and ordinal levels of measurement here. So I'm going to click OK. Okay, the first box tells you how many cases were used in calculating these statistics. And as I said, there are no missing values, so it's always 474. And here we have the frequencies for gender, employment category, and minority classification. If you look at the employment category box, you'll see that it gives us the actual number of cases in each category, so the frequency. The next column gives you the percentage. And then the column next to that gives you something called the valid percentage, which is identical to percent here. And that is because we have no missing values. If out of this 474 cases, we did not have data for four people, percentage is still calculated out of 474 total. But valid percent will be calculated out of 470. So it does not include missing values and is more representative of the data that you actually have. The cumulative percent is going to be the valid percent added up cumulatively. And this can come in handy when you're looking for percentile cutoffs. So here it's saying that 82.3% of the data lies within custodial and clerical positions. If I scroll down a bit further, you'll see that we get bar charts for all of those variables in one go. Okay, the next type of analysis I will show you is called an explore analysis. Explore analysis allows us to get statistics for scale levels of measurement broken down into groups. So if you want to know the statistics relating to current salary for males and females separately, one way to do that is to do an explore analysis. So I'll go into the analyze menu, 
descriptive starts and explores the third one down. The dependent list box is where you put your dependent variable, which in this case is going to be current salary. And the factor list box is where we put our breakdown variable or independent variable, which is going to be gender in this case. You'll notice in the display area that it will by default display both statistics and plots. If you click on the statistics button, you can change things like um, the confidence interval. So the confidence interval for a mean will be 95% if you're only comparing two groups, but this will change if you're comparing more than two groups. You can also ask for percentiles and estimates of outliers. But I'll click cancel. If you click on the plots button, you'll see what types of plots you will get by default. You'll get box plots, which are very good for looking at the normality distributions. Um, and you'll also get something called a stem and leaf plot. Stem and leaf plots were used by lecturers to torture first year statistics students because we had to do these by hand. If you've never seen a stem and leaf plot before, I will leave this ticked, but in future you probably want to untick it. So I will click continue and then OK. The first box tells you how many males and females there were and if there were any missing cases. And then we get our explore descriptives. So the first half of the box are the statistics for females and the second half for males. It gives you the mean and the standard error of the mean, which is used to calculate this 95% confidence interval. 95% confidence intervals are useful for determining whether or not there will be a statistically significant difference between the groups you're comparing. So if the mean for males was included in the lower and upper bound confidence interval for females, there would be no significant difference. But you can see here the mean for males is not included within this confidence interval. So there is a statistically significant difference if the underlying assumptions of the test are acceptable. And I'll go through that in the advanced class and explain what that means. We also get the 5% trimmed mean. This is what the mean would be if you trimmed off 2.5% from the bottom end of the distribution and 2.5% from the top end of the distribution. Then it recalculates the mean. If your mean is vastly different from the trimmed mean, this suggests that you may have influential outliers because outliers can influence means quite significantly. The median is also reported, so this is the 50th percentile or the middle point of the distribution. The variance, which is a standard deviation squared, but they give you standard deviation as well. Minimum and maximum values. Range refers to the range between the minimum and maximum values. You also get the interquartile range. So this is the range between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And that relates to the variability around the median or 50th percentile point. It also gives you estimates of skewness and kurtosis. Skewness refers to whether or not you have a positive or a negative skewed distribution or a normal distribution. And ketosis refers to how pointy or flat that distribution is. So is there a lot of variability, in which case it will be flat, or is there very little variability, which will make the distribution pointier? And then we get the same statistics for males here. If I scroll down a bit further, you will see the stem and leaf plots for males and females. So this is a stem and leaf plot for females only. If you skew your head to the side, to the right hand side, you'll probably notice that this is essentially a frequency histogram, but it is made with the actual data. It says here that the stem width is 10,000, which means here, this represents 10,000. And two leaves of five means that there are two data points 
of 15,000. Having multiple 16,000s and 17,000s, 18,000s and 19,000s and so on. So when I showed you the frequency histogram, you could see that the binning changed the look of the distribution quite considerably. This is one way to create a frequency histogram that doesn't misrepresent the data at all. It cannot be manipulated that way. But most people don't report these anymore. If I scroll down a bit further, these are the box plots. Box plots also tell you about the normality of your distribution. What we would like to see is something that's roughly symmetrical, like the one for females here. The thick black line that you see in the middle of the box is where the median is, the 50th percentile. The lower edge of the box is the 25th percentile, and the top edge of the box is the 75th percentile. The whiskers um, show you the range of the data, and the dots that go beyond that are what SPSS flags as potential outliers. The numbers that you see are the row numbers in your data set currently. The circles are not massive outliers and the stars indicate more extreme outliers. So here we have case number 29 again because case number 29 is still in row 29. The next type of analysis we'll have a look at is called cross tabs. And this is how we look at the relationship between two nominal and or ordinal levels of measurement. So I will go into the analyze menu, descriptive stats, and then choose cross tabs. I'm going to have a look at the relationship between a person's employment category and whether or not they're in a minority classification. So I'm going to put employment category into the rows box and minority into the columns box. I usually put the variable that has the least number of categories into the columns because it fits better on an A4 page, but it really doesn't matter which way you put these around. Now I'm going to click on the cells button so that I can not only get the observed frequencies in each one of these categories and the cross tabulations in the table, but I can also get the row percentages, which will give me percentage within employment category, and column percentage, which will give me percentage within minority classification. Then click continue. Instead of clicking OK, I am now going to click the Paste button. So I'll click Paste, and you'll see that we get a syntax editor instead. So I mentioned previously that if you want to save your syntax and run it later on, it needs to be in a syntax editor and not just as text in your output. What this has done is pasted the syntax that will run this analysis, but it has not actually run the analysis yet. Okay, so in order to run the analysis, we need to select the portion of the syntax that we want to run, go to the run menu, and then click run selection. And then it has actually produced output. When I go back to the syntax editor, I'll explain a little bit why um, syntax is quite important. Most of the time when you're studying at university, your lecturer or supervisor will want to see a record of what you have done to your data and why. Um, also, if you um, present your results for publication, you need to keep a record of this information. It's a good idea to keep it in a syntax editor because it keeps it all together for one one reason. Um, it also allows you to rerun the analysis at any point in the future if you need to. So if you find that you've made a data entry error in job category or minority, instead of having to go through all the menus again, you can just change the data and then rerun the syntax. Syntax files are also useful if you 
have um, data files for separate years, for example. So if you had a data file for 2017, 2018 and 2019, then you could run your analysis and save the syntax on the 2017 file, and then open your 2018 file and just run that syntax without having to do it all over again. And then you can open up the 2019 file, run the syntax and it does it automatically for you. A handy thing to do with a syntax file is also to annotate it so that you know what each section does. You have a record of what you've done and what the reasoning was behind it. To annotate, you have to pre have the prefix of a asterisk. When I type in an asterisk, you'll notice that data set activate becomes grayed out. That's because everything from the asterisk to the first full stop it finds will be considered annotation and not syntax that can be run. I normally type in more than one asterisk, just so it's clear that that's where my annotation is. And then I can type in a description. Um, cross tabs for job category by minority. When I hit the full stop, only that annotation is grayed out and then the rest is available and active to be able to run again. Syntax files are saved separately as well, so I'll just save this as syntax1 and syntax files have an SPS extension. So I'll click save. Now I'll go back to the output file and we'll have a look at the cross tabulation. The first box again tells you how many cases were used in this cross tabulation. And then we get information about the frequencies and the percentages broken down into these categories. So here, 276 people who were not in a minority were in clerical positions. And 87% who were in a minority, uh, 87 people who were in a minority were in clerical positions. Then in the next row, we get the percentages within employment category. So within clerical positions, 76% were not in a minority group and 24% were. The third row shows us percentage within minority classification, so within the columns. 74.6% of people who were not in a minority were in clerical positions. 83.7% who were in a minority were in clerical positions, and then so on. When you have a large amount of output um, and you want to get that into a different file format, say you want this table in a Word document so you can um, print it out, or you want this graph in a Word document or a PDF document, you can just copy and paste into a Word document and that will do the job for you. When you copy and paste these charts and graphs, they will paste only as an image file. So you're not able to change it in any way, shape or form. So be aware of that and make sure that the graph is exactly the way you want it to look before you copy and paste it into a Word document. Tables, however, can still be changed. If you want to export the entire output file into a different format so that you can read it on a computer that doesn't have SPSS, for example, or if you're upgrading SPSS to a different version, it's a good idea to export your output into something that will always be able to read it because sometimes SPSS has backwards compatibility issues. The backwards compatibility doesn't really relate to tables like this, but it might not be able to read the graphs anymore. So to export the entire document to a different file format, all you need to do is go into the file menu and then export and then choose objects to export all visible. The reason for that is there's a lot of information that is embedded in this output file that you can't see now and you don't want to see it when you export it either. 
So choose all visible. Then in the drop down menu, choose the type of output you want to create. So there are quite a few options. If you export to an Excel file, it will only export text and tables and not graphs. This can be handy if you want to export a table into Excel and you want to create your graphs there because you're more comfortable with that format. You can also export to an HTML document, PDF document, a PowerPoint document will create a slide for each one of your graphics. You can export to a text document which will only export the text. So if you want to export your annotations only, this is quite useful. The most common one is to export into Word and everything gets exported into Word. Or you can choose graphics only. This will create an individual JPEG file for every single one of your charts, but you won't see any of the text. So if I select Word RTF, it's going to save my images as JPEG files. You choose where you want it to save in the file name box. And you can optionally tick open the containing folder so that you can find it more easily. So I'll click OK. And if I double click on output, you'll see what happens. Here's my Word document. We have all our syntax, which can actually be changed because it's just text. But this is now just a JPEG image. And the only thing I can change is the size of it. So I can click and drag it smaller or larger. Our tables will be able to be changed as well. So I can change this back to mean from average and the formatting will stay the same. Okay, so I'll close this document now. And I will show you um, how to manipulate your data a little bit further. The first thing we'll do is compute new variables. So sometimes when you're looking at your data set, you want to create a new variable based on the information you already have. So for example, you might want to create a new variable which represents the difference between a person's current salary and what they began with. All you have to do is go into the transform menu, select compute variable, and then we have to put in a name for the new variable that we're creating. And remember, you are limited in what you can call this variable in the data set. So I'm going to call it um, salary underscore if because I can't have spaces. And then in the numeric expression box, I have to put in the formula for this variable. You can just type in um, salary if you want to. But if you want to be sure that you don't make any typos, it's probably easier to click on the variable here in the list, current salary, and then the arrow to move it into the numeric expression box. And then you can hit the minus key here on screen or on your keyboard, and then I will get beginning salary and move that into the box as well. So it's a very simple formula. Please be aware that when you're entering formulas, that sometimes the symbols aren't exactly what you think they are. Um, in Excel, if you wanted to raise a number to a power, say if I wanted cell begin to be um, raised to the power of, whoops, there we go, of two, so cell begin squared, it would be a hat two. But in SPSS, we use a double asterisk. So it would be cell begin double asterisk two. If you wanted to use other arithmetic functions, um, there is a function group area here which lists them all. If you want to reduce it to just arithmetic functions, you click on arithmetic and there they all are. Say if you wanted to do a log transformation, I can click on LN and see what that does. So that returns the base E log of a number. Um, this is where you'll also find date and time arithmetic. 
so that you can calculate a person's age based on their birth date, for example. But all I want to do is calculate the difference between salary and their beginning salary. So I'll click OK. It will automatically go to your output viewer because it has pasted the syntax there. To see what it's actually done, we need to go back to the data file. And here is our new variable, salary diff. Then all we have to go, all we have to do is go to the variable view and fill out the appropriate boxes here in the variable view. Another thing that you might want to do is to recode variables. So if you wanted to recode job category, so that one was um, custodial and two was clerical, for example, you can recode that variable. I'm going to show you something a little bit more complex than just changing two numbers. And I'm going to take education level in years and create three equal sized groups out of them. So to do that, I'll go into the transform menu. And you'll notice that there are a couple of different recode options. The main ones are to recode into same variables. This will overwrite the existing variable that you have. So be very careful about recoding into same variables unless you're absolutely sure. Recoding into different variables keeps the original variable and creates a new one that's recoded. So to be on the safe side, I'm going to recode into different variables. I'll take education level in years and move that into the box. You'll notice that it has the label for that variable and then a question mark. The question mark is there because it doesn't know what to call the new variable that you're going to create. So we will name it here in the output variable area and I'll call it edu underscore level because it's the name that's going to appear in the data file. But I can also label it more descriptively underneath at the same time. Educational level group. The question mark is still there. We have to click this change button to make it go away. So please do not forget to click the change button, otherwise it's not going to work. Now I can click on the old and new values button and I can select the ranges of values in education level to group together. So for my first group, I'm going to group everything from the lowest number through to 12 years. I could do that value by value. So I could put 10 in here and give that a new value of one, 11 in here, put, give that a new value of one and so on. But there are range buttons that I can use. If you don't know, the lowest value in your data set, that's okay. You can select range lowest through to the value that's in this box. So it will automatically pick the minimum value to begin with. And then whatever you put into this box, say 12, it will group all of those values together. In the new value box, I'm going to code that as one, because essentially we're creating a new coding scheme. Then click the add button to move it into the old new box. Our next range is going to be from 13 years to 15 years. So I will use the range button for this one and put 13 into the first box and 15 into the second box. Please make sure that um, your categories don't overlap. It will probably warn you about that, but you also don't want to miss values. So if you have values to two decimal places, make sure that you're using the correct decimals to include all of your data in your grouping. In this case, I'm using whole numbers for education level, and I don't need to worry about that. So this range will have a new value of two in my coding scheme and I'll click add. For the last one, I want everything from 16 through to the highest value. 
So I don't know what the highest value is, but I can click on this third range button, which will take whatever's in this box, which is 16, through to the highest value in education. Then I'll give that a new value of three and click add. And then I'm finished. Click continue and OK. Again, it will go back to my output viewer because this is where the syntax is pasted. If I go back to my data set, I have a new variable called edu level. You can see that here in the data view. I have ones, twos and threes and nothing is missed. Everything has a value. Then I need to go into the variable view and label those three groups. Another handy thing that you can do with SPSS um, is to split the file. So before when we were creating the um, statistics for males and females separately, um, we used an explore analysis. There is a way to break down every single analysis that you do into groups in one go. So you can split the file by gender and then you will get separate statistics for males and females, you'll get separate graphs for males and females and so on until you turn the split file off. So to do that we go into the data menu, select split file, the third one from the bottom, and then you can either analyze all cases and not create groups, create groups in the compare groups function, which means that you will get, for example, one descriptive statistics table that's split into male and female, or you can organize the output by groups, which will give you a separate, gra um, separate table for males and a separate table for females. So it depends on how you want the output to look. But I'm just going to compare groups and I'm going to use gender as the grouping variable. Please be aware that it needs to sort the file by your grouping variable in order to do this. So here you can see that males and females are not already sorted. The row numbers are going to change according to your ID numbers. So it has to sort the file. If I click OK, again it's going to give you the syntax. When I go back to the data file, you'll notice that all the females are grouped together and all the males are grouped together. One way that it reminds you that the split file is on is in the bottom right hand corner. It says split by gender, but it will become very, very obvious as soon as you run any type of analysis. So I'm gonna use a shortcut to what we've done today by clicking on this icon underneath the data menu. And when you hover over it, it says recall recently used dialogues. So I'm going to go to a descriptives analysis. So all of these variables are still in the box. When I click OK, you'll see that you get one table that's split into female stats and male stats. The same thing will happen to charts and graphs. So if I do a simple scatter plot again and then click OK, you get one separately for males and one for females. To unsplit the file again, you just need to go into the data menu, select split file and tick analyze all cases, do not create groups and then OK. And it says the split file is off because it pastes the syntax into the output viewer. Another thing you can do is to select only a selection of your data set. So if you only wanted to have a data set that consisted of employees who have been in this company at least 72 months, for example, you don't need to create a new data set just for those people and delete everyone who hasn't been in the company that long. You can select those cases and keep your data set intact. To do that we go into the data menu again, choose select cases, 
and then we will select cases based on a logical argument if a logical condition is satisfied. And then we click on the if button and this is based on how long they've been in the company. So we will put months since hire into the box and that will be greater than or equal to, and there's a greater than or equal to symbol here, 72 months. Then I'll click continue and OK. Again, it's posted the syntax in the output viewer. When we go to the data file, it's not obvious that it has filtered out data, unless you notice that there is a new column called filter. Filter, if it has a one in the filter column, that value is, that case is selected. If it has a zero in that column, that case is not selected. Another visual reminder is, the case number of unselected cases has been crossed out. The third reminder is that in the bottom right hand corner, it says that your data filter is on. Okay, so you do have to be careful when working with filtering data to remember that you're not working with the full data set. Now, if I do any statistics, um, so if I go back to descriptives, and rerun this, you'll notice that I don't have 474 cases anymore. I now have 368. To turn the filter off, you go back into the data menu, select cases, and then select all cases, the first radio button, and then OK, and your filter is turned off. So that's all I wanted to show you today. If you have any questions about how to use SVSS for your data after this workshop, please feel free to contact me um, by email or the digital literacy team. The statistical consulting unit is also available for honours or postgraduate students um, for any statistical consulting needs. Thank you for coming.